everybody. Welcome to the webinar series on managing drought in the Southern Plains. I'm Mark Schaefer at the Southern Climate Impact Planning Program. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Margaret Boone, SIP Program Manager, is managing the webinar. Today's topic is agriculture and livestock. Brian Fuchs, climatologist and drought monitor author at the National Drought Mitigation Center, will begin with an update on the current drought status and outlook for the next several months. Our agricultural presenters include Daryl Peel, Oklahoma State University Cooperative Extension, Mark Hodges from Plains Grains, Inc., and John Zach, Professor of Biology and Microbi Microbial Ecology at Texas Tech University. Daryl presented on our livestock webinar back in December. He will provide an update on the cattle industry since then and look forward. Mark will talk about this past winter's wheat crop and challenges as we look for the next crop. John will look at the development of the cotton crop in the Texas High Plains, including the impact drought has had on a little known but important microbe. We have several state climatologists on the call as well to talk about some of the more local changes within our region. This is part of an ongoing series made possible through the support of several organizations, including the National Drought Mitigation Center, National Integrated Drought Information System, (NIDIS), and NOAA Regional Climate Services. We also greatly appreciate those of you who join us in this webinar series and recognize the valuable time that you commit to participate. You may ask questions or make comments at any time through typing in the chat box. We will address questions at the end of the presentation. Each webinar is recorded and posted on the SCIP YouTube channel. Slides and summaries from previous topics are posted on the NIDIS Drop Portal in the Southern Plains region and on the SCIP website. You can also friend SCIP on Facebook for updates. And I'll turn it over to Brian for an update on drought conditions and outlook. Brian? Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending. Again, I'm Brian Fuchs. I'm a climatologist at the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and also one of the drought monitor authors. And I'm going to quickly go through an update of what's going on in the region, uh, a little bit on the outlook, on uh, where we're going to be going forward, and uh, have some time for questions as well. So, first slide. Um, here is where we were back in June. And if you look through the region, uh, even the Midwest into the Central Plains, even into the Southern Plains, uh, you see uh, a mixed bag, some, some dryness, and uh, so a lot of drought-free areas. And, and I'll go over to the next slide. And here we were back in July when we had the last uh, skip call. And you can see some of those colors filling in. Uh, the tans and the browns are showing up in places in East Texas and, and Oklahoma that were uh, in fairly good shape but earlier in the year. We were starting to see some dryness, and now I'll go to the next slide, and here's today's map. And, and boy, you can really see the stark contrast of where we were just a few months ago and how quickly and rapidly the drought has developed and intensified over the region. Uh, we see that uh, uh, much of this same area that we saw improvements over the winter months and into the first part of spring, especially eastern Oklahoma, east Texas, uh, some of those areas have really filled in with uh, drought developing. And, and the temperature component has been a huge part of this. Uh, you know, temperatures last week in Oklahoma in, in the 100 and teens uh, for multiple days and, and well over 100 uh, for several weeks now in, in much of this region. And along with the dryness, this has really led to the rapid intensification of drought through this region. And a lot of it can also be relayed back to last year's drought, that even with the recovery that we were seeing earlier in the year, that vulnerability was still there, and some of the same impacts came right back in rapid fashion once the, the summer did kick in. So go to the next slide. Uh, here are some statistics for the country. I'm going to focus on the contiguous 48 below. Currently, we're about 62% of the country is in drought. Uh, start of the calendar year, that was about 28.5%, so we can see that progression through time. And you can also see uh, at the start of the calendar year, about 10% of the country was in D3 or D4 drought compared to 24% now, so a little more than double. Uh, next slide. And here is the, the regional perspective. So I'm going to go through that same progression from June, July to August uh, just to show this progression. So going back with this regional zoom, uh, back in June, we did see some drought in the region, about 66% of the region at that point, but very little D3 and then hardly any D4, just a little pocket in Texas. And then into July on the next slide, uh, we can see that that uh, amount of drought really jumped up to over 85%. And very similar to uh, what we'd seen a year ago 
back in July as well, which I had highlighted on the last call. And then going into uh, today's map, uh, we see a lot more D4 coming into that region. Uh, we see a, almost all D3 and D4 in Oklahoma and in Kansas. Uh, that area of East Texas into Southern Louisiana, I know Barry, you're going to talk about that, uh, the conditions in Louisiana a little bit. But uh, those areas have seen some regular rainfall through this event. And then there's places in, in eastern uh, New Mexico and into the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles that you can really see that carryover of the drought from last year into this year and how uh, we've seen the development and expansion uh, through the last several months. So currently in the region, about 84% of uh, the southern plains is in drought right now, and about 38% is in D3 or D4. 11 percent, uh, almost 11 and a half percent in D4 itself. So uh, we're seeing that uh, that change uh, compared to a year ago. Hey, we were almost at 50 percent of the region was in D4 at this time last year. So I guess we take the good and the bad. Uh, most of that was focused in Texas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico last year. But towards the end of the summer, we started seeing that uh, drought push up into portions of uh, Kansas as well. So the next slide. Uh, looking at just some precipitation and uh, standardized precipita precipitation index numbers, uh, the last 30 days uh, using the ACES systems from the regional climate centers, we can see that uh, the, that wet pattern over uh, the Gulf Coast of Texas and into southern Louisiana where they've had a, a surplus of six to eight inches above normal or even more in, in some of the isolated areas just over the last 30 days. But in contrast, we look into portions of Oklahoma up into Kansas where those deficits are anywhere from four to six inches uh, just over the last 30 days. The last 60 days, you see that same pattern. Uh, the haves and have-nots are very obvious, and there seems to be more have-nots with those departures anywhere from uh, four to eight inches below normal just over the last two months. Uh, next slide. Looking at things for year-to-date, I mentioned that uh, improvement that we've seen from uh, earlier in the year, and that really shows up well on this year-to-date uh, departure from normal precipitation map where we can see anywhere from 5 to 10 inches above normal commonplace across uh, portions of East Texas into Louisiana. But you look at the contrast as well, that just for the calendar year we can see deficits of 10 inches or more in many places in New Mexico and Texas, Oklahoma, up into Kansas, Arkansas stands out, southern Missouri. And then even the last 12 months, uh, this, this graphic here really caught my eye today when I pulled it up. I highlighted some of those areas along the Gulf Coast of Texas and in Oklahoma and Arkansas where that 12-month departure is uh, 16 inches or more. But look at uh, uh, north central Arkansas. Uh, we see a surplus at the last 12 months of anywhere from 4 to 8 inches during that time frame. And uh, the, the stark contrast is just how dry it has been over the last six months or so in that region. They're, they're in D4 drought right now. So this really is a great example of short-term versus long-term, where on the long-term you can show these surpluses, but on the uh, short-term, that area has just been significantly drier than, than uh, it has been historically. Going to the next slide, uh, the 30-day and 60-day SPIs, uh, you can really see, uh, again, where that dome of high pressure has set up, uh, where the precipitation has been lacking. And then you look on the fringe of that area, you can really see uh, that ring of fire, that dome of uh, precipitation as it circulates around that high. And when you see SPI values in that minus two range over the last 30 and 60 days, those are directly correlated to D4 conditions. So it, you can see how much D4 we have on the map and where we've seen the intensification. Well, this, is, this really tells that story in short order to see exactly where this dryness has been, it's been consistently dry, and the magnitude of dryness has been there as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit on the outlook now. Uh, over the next five days, we see a little bit of a change in temperature regime over uh, the Midwest and Central Plains where we're actually expecting temperatures below normal uh, for the next five days, which uh, we haven't seen that uh, much through the summer months at all. Uh, we see some uh, heat over the western U.S. with departures anywhere from three to six degrees above normal. Uh, so a welcome change for some of these areas that have had uh, uh, suffering from quite a bit of heat over the last several weeks and, and throughout the summer. Uh, the five-day precipitation outlook uh, doesn't show a lot of uh, precipitation through the Plain States. Uh, again, we're seeing a lot of that getting pushed to the east 
Uh, fairly significant amounts again in southern Louisiana, uh, close to two inches anticipated with the models. And then again, that monsoonal flow coming from the southwest is showing up. Uh, Colorado seems to have been one of the early winners with some of this precipitation over the last few weeks as we have seen uh, regular precipitation uh, in the southwest but really making its way up into uh, uh, Colorado and Utah. All right, next slide. Uh, the 14-day outlook, it shows uh, the heat that uh, we were seeing over the, the western U.S. kind of pushing over to the east during that time. And then some below normal temperatures are anticipated over uh, the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rockies. And in that same area, if you look at the precipitation outlook, some uh, wet, wetter uh, regions or uh, in the outlook, some uh, wetter uh, uh, models uh, output is being shown through of the Northern Plains into the Great Lakes. Again, that uh, moisture plume in the Southwest associated with the monsoon. And then it stays wet along that Gulf Coast. So maybe this is a an early El Nino signal that's uh, uh, showing up even before we have uh, a true El Nino being uh, uh, on the books. We see a, a dry signal through uh, the southern plains into the central plains with uh, below normal precipitation anticipated all the way from Texas up into uh, portions of Nebraska. Next slide. And here is the seasonal outlook. This came out uh, a little over a week ago now from the Climate Prediction Center. In August, uh, boy, have we seen this pattern all summer. It looks warm and dry. Uh, looking over the, the region, we see the greatest uh, uh, temperatures anticipated over the Nebraska, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa region. But uh, uh, we're seeing above normal temperatures through much of the country, continuing a pattern that we've seen over the last year. Uh, for precipitation in August, we see dryness associated with that as well, all the way from uh, Nebraska to Indiana down into Texas, uh, and that monsoonal uh, plume of moisture still is showing up for the month of August. Hopefully it really does kick in here in earnest and, and bring some relief to the southwest. And again, maybe some of that moisture will uh, trickle into portions of the plain states and maybe help break down uh, this, this long wave pattern that has been consistent with the drought that we've seen. Uh, the seasonal outlook uh, um, August through October does not change much. We're seeing warm conditions uh, pretty much through much of the country outside of uh, the West Coast and the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Plains. And then that dry signal continues right over the Midwest, over Iowa, Illinois. Uh, we're continuing to see that moist signal uh, with the monsoons in the Southwest and then along the Gulf Coast that maintains itself. So uh, some places will continue to see some, some precipitation. And others are going to, you know, even through much of the plain states with equal chances, that would go a long way into uh, starting to recharge some of those soils and banking some of that moisture as we go into fall and winter. So uh, equal chances of, of normal condition uh, would, would really go a long way of just trying to uh, reverse some of these conditions. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a progression of the seasonal drought outlook. This is the one that was released back in June. And, and uh, with what the, the folks at the Climate Prediction Center had uh, in their pockets at that time, we weren't looking for a lot of drought uh, through the Midwest and High Plains regions. Uh, even through uh, the Southern Plains, those areas that had been wet, they were anticipating some of that recovery to, to, to stick. And, and uh, going to the next slide, uh, we see in July, boy, that, that was a really big change of, of what was anticipated with what the models were showing. Uh, but even at that same time, we had seen some rain in, into Oklahoma and East Texas and not really seen uh, drought developing in those wide areas. Uh, they were picking up on the monsoonal flow at that point. Uh, going into the latest seasonal drought outlook that was released last week, uh, a stark contrast to where we were back in June. We're seeing a lot of that area of the Midwest staying in drought, continuing to see drought developing into portions of Texas, into portions of the Northern Plains. Uh, some recovery anticipated in the southeast as well as the southwest uh, with this anticipated moisture that we've seen on uh, multiple models from uh, the Climate Prediction Center. So there is hope, uh, but it just doesn't look like, likely that we're going to see too much in the change of uh, not the, old, the overall pattern of the drought, but even the intensity that going into fall and even into winter now as this takes us all the way through the end of October, I anticipate there's still being quite a bit of drought being discussed and uh, some drought concerns and impacts being felt across uh, much of the Midwest and into the Southern Plains. Uh, I think that was my last slide. Yep, my contact information is up here. 
if anyone uh, wants to get a hold of me, my phone number and email address is up there, and, and I think we'll uh, wait for questions till the end. Okay, thank you, Brian. We'll now move on to uh, Daryl, who's going to um, take a look at uh, at the cattle industry and um, and early hopes and how that's been going. Daryl. Okay. All right. Well, it was very good to be here again and visit with you. Let's move on to the next slide and, and jump right into this. Um, you know, to start the discussion of this year's uh, livestock market impacts, take a quick look at where we ended up after last year. U.S. Uh, beef cow herd dropped uh, just under a million head last year. If you look at the Southern Plains states, Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, and, and Arkansas, you get well over a million head or a little bit over a million head, so you can account for all of that decrease in the drought region from last year. There was actually expansion occurring in some other states, and that becomes important when we discuss the livestock market impacts. There was such a contrast last year between the haves and the have-nots in the northern part of the country versus the southern part of the country, and that set up a lot of the market impacts, and that's a big contrast to what we're seeing this year in terms of market impact. Let's go to the next slide. Obviously, in terms of beef cow slaughter and herd liquidation, uh, the numbers are still running well below a year ago on a national basis. Um, and we expected that because last year's numbers were so big. And it's really difficult because of this to figure out how much drought liquidation we're having this year. The numbers are below a year ago, but they're only about 8 or 9% below a year ago. I would have expected, had we not had drought again in 2012, that we would be running closer to 18 to 20 percent below a year ago. So I have no doubt that we are seeing some additional liquidation. Because it's much more widespread, it's harder to get a handle on. The uh, slaughter data is regional in nature, and it's not concentrated in one region. Uh, so it's a little more difficult to sort of peg exactly what's happening where, but clearly we are in, in additional herd liquidation mode, more so in other regions than in, than in Oklahoma and Texas and the Southern Plains generally, in large part because we have not rebuilt uh, significantly at all from last year's depletion. So we didn't have as many cows. We didn't have as many uh, any places that were as vulnerable to getting into marginal forage conditions as quickly this summer, although we're getting there very quickly now. Uh, and so in the last four weeks, since the 4th of July through last week, uh, in Oklahoma, the auction receipts for cow slaughter uh, or for cows coming through the auctions, many of, many of whom are going to slaughter, those auction receipt totals for cows were down 77% from a year ago. So obviously we were in massive liquidation mode last year. We're not seeing as much of it yet in the southern plains, although I have no doubt that, that we are doing some liquidation. But I suspect there, there's more herd liquidation occurring in other regions this year compared to the southern plains, simply because we did so much last year. Next slide. The, you know, this, this uh, captures what, uh, what Brian showed on the, the, the drought monitor, the forage conditions nationwide. Sixty percent of the entire country has poor to very poor range conditions. Uh, you know, that's obviously way above last year and, and way above normal. Um, and so it's a, it's a very widespread event. Next slide. Oh, you did get my update this morning. I thought I'd throw this in. This has nothing to do with livestock markets, but I was flying from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee to Houston, Texas yesterday morning, and the one feature that I could pick out easily from the airplane was the Mississippi River, and, and it was most notable to me because of the size of the sandbars in the river. Uh, I thought this was really uh, telling on how low the river is and, and obviously how widespread the drought is in terms of the Mississippi River drainage. I, with the help of Google Earth this morning, I was able to figure out that just off to the left side of this picture would be Vicksburg, Mississippi. So this, uh, the, the right-hand side of the screen is northeast uh, Louisiana, and uh, that's farther south than I realized we were in the river at that point. I thought that was kind of telling at how low the river is right now. Next slide. In terms of the Southern Plains specifically, as far as forage conditions, uh, you know, last year at this time, over 90% of the region was in poor to very poor conditions. We're at about 60%, which is roughly equal to the national average right now, but you can see how quickly it has advanced as Brian alluded to in the last uh, four or five weeks, it has jumped very dramatically. Uh, that was also very visible in the air flying into Oklahoma City yesterday morning. Next slide. The other half of this story this year that's very different than last year is the corn crop. And, and it doesn't affect what's happening in this region, but from a livestock perspective, obviously the drought in the, in the Midwest and other parts of the country. Uh, this shows corn production for the last 25 years or so. The second to the right-hand bar is the 2012 crop. And the, the dark blue part is uh, this week's estimate, and I say that because it changes very dramatically, but from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, currently estimating a, a, a little bit over a 10 billion bushel corn crop. But I put in here the light blue shaded part on the top of that 
is, uh, is relative to what USDA came out in May with their first official estimate of the, uh, the new corn crop was at uh, you know, almost 14.8 billion bushels. So that means we're running about 4.4 billion bushels or close to that. Uh, in just about 90 days' time, we've dropped our estimates for the crop production that much. Obviously, that's a huge factor for livestock markers, markets and, and, and uh, any other uses for corn. Go to the next slide. Um, we have changed our you know, price expectations. Again, these things are very dynamic, changing almost daily uh, or minute by minute in some cases. But we're now expecting a 2012 you know, annual average crop year price that's going to be pushing $8 a bushel. Uh, obviously, that has enormous impacts on cattle markets. And so that sets up the next couple slides to talk about where we really are then on, on cattle markets. Let's go to the next slide. If you look at the heavier weight feeder cattle, you'll see that we have dropped pretty dramatically in the last five or six weeks or eight weeks. Uh, much of the, you know, these, these are the cattle that, that are going into feedlots. They're facing those high feed prices. Uh, and so really the impact on these feeder markets you would attribute largely to the change in the corn market and the corn price expectations for, for the next crop year. Uh, and so it's having that dramatic impact. I guess the, the positive side of this is we're at, at the same levels we were last year. We haven't uh, dropped below year ago levels. We still have a fundamentally uh, supply driven tight, tight uh, inventory kind of a cattle market. But obviously these short term drought impacts are very dramatic. And, and we've had just a dramatic turnaround in feedlot expectations for, uh, for feeding cattle for the next 12 to 15 months. And so it has that impact on these feeder markets. Next slide. On the calf market, it's been even more dramatic because those calves are a little ways down the road from entering the feedlot, but all of those expectations for high feed prices eventually plays into uh, the calf prices, plus you add in the current uh, impacts on forage conditions around the country. And, and we are seeing at least anecdotally, it's uh, more so than in the data per se, but we're, we're clearly seeing some early marketing of kids in other parts of the country, not so much in the Southern Plains proper, but there are folks in, in other parts of the country selling cattle early, auction volumes that are reported much larger than average in other parts of the country, much like ours were last year. And so the combined effect of poor forage conditions and high grain prices is reflected in these calf prices. Again, we're slightly above year ago levels still, but we've seen a dramatic drop in these markets. The good news is cattle markets and the beef market uh, from a demand standpoint all seem to sort of uh, appear to be near a bottom right now. I think we've probably done the majority of the damage to these markets at this point. They'll stabilize and begin some level of recovery, but because the drought conditions are very uncertain at this point, how fast and how much that recovery will be is very much up in the air at this point. Um, you know, in the Southern Plains and given the tight supply of cattle, uh, should we see fall moisture where we have prospects for wheat pasture, where we have prospects for some cool season forages, the best use and so on, uh, because numbers are limited and because we have again for the second year marketed cattle, uh, you know, well ahead of schedule instead of the normal fall wean calf run, uh, we move these cattle early, uh, we could actually see uh, a pretty dramatic turnaround in this market in the next uh, six weeks or so, but it's obviously going to depend on some improvement in forage conditions, not only in the Southern Plains, but generally in the country. And so uh, the potential is still there, but we have seen more. And the other thing I would say is that this year's uh, market impacts have probably been more typical, more what we would expect to see in a drought of this magnitude compared to what happened a year ago. Uh, we didn't see the markets drop nearly as much last year, given the magnitude of the drought. But it was because for the regions that were affected here in the Southern Plains, there was lots of alternative places to go and lots of alternative feeds available in other parts of the country. And this year, the drought impacts have been much quicker to develop and much more dramatic on cattle prices, simply because the, the widespread drought has, has made it so that there's really no alternative uh, for these cattle. They, there's no other place to go for forage and there's no place to go to the feedlot except to feed them very expensive corn. And so the drought impacts have been more dramatic and, and really much more typical of what you would expect to see in a drought this year. Next slide. Uh, cold cow prices, again, we are liquidating some cows. We have seen some decrease in cold cow prices. Uh, and that probably means that we won't see as big a fall run, so there won't be quite as much price pressure normally that we see in October and November. Um, uh, and we're still above a year ago level. We still have a relatively strong market, but that's there. And again, depending on what happens in the next couple of months, we'll, we'll determine just uh, how this, this market plays out over that time period as well. Next slide. In 
summary, I guess I would say that uh, you know we're, we're seeing bigger and somewhat more typical drought impacts this year uh, compared to what we saw a year ago. Uh, they're probably more short-term in nature in that there's more, more potential for them to recover. Once we do see an improvement, although you know when and if that happens uh, is, is very much the question right now, the impacts on cattle is very much a combined effect of the, the impacts on forage directly in terms of uh, cow calf and stalker regions versus uh, uh, in addition to the, the impact on the grain market in crop production areas and the indirect effect that that, that that has back to cattle feeding prospects. Southern Plains impacts generally have been less in terms of a direct impact here, uh, but they're certainly growing um, and, and you know again over the next uh, 30 to 60 days without some improvement we do have many producers in the Southern Plains that will be looking at making some drought force decisions in the sense of uh, early weaning calves, early cow culling, doing things to, uh, to to reduce the demands on resources. We're at a position now in most cases where folks kind of know, you know what they've got in the way of hay stock. They know what their pastures look like. We may or may not get some fall rains and some fall and winter forage out of that. If we don't, then producers really need to be uh, taking stock of what they have and figuring a plan out on how they can get through the winter given what they have and then uh, if we get anything better than that, we can work from that uh, as time goes on. Next slide. That's all I have in the way of a quick update on the markets. Uh, be happy to have any questions that you have. There's my email. I'm not very hard to find. Uh, unfortunately, it's pretty easy to find me. So uh, if you have any questions uh, during the conference here or, or later, get a hold of me. Thank you, Daryl. And we'll move on to, to Mark. And I think uh, Daryl sets the stage because uh, wheat and cattle, of course, in this part of the country are very strongly linked. So um, Mark will tell us about how things look for the wheat crop. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, you know, the first thing we probably need to do is do a little back, background on the wheat production and how that happens. Uh, although I will be focusing on Texas and Oklahoma, as Daryl said, uh, the drought's been much more widespread now, and, uh, so you could apply this to other states, but really we have a component in Oklahoma and Texas that other states don't have, and that's the livestock component. And of course, we do feel within the wheat industry that livestock is the first value-added component of wheat production. Obviously, there's an abundance of works of warm season grasses, but uh, there's no bridge other than uh, the extensive wheat production that's done. And so hopefully producers can reap some of those benefits, uh, but it does depend on getting moisture early. Now opposed to other parts of the country, we do stretch that wheat plant uh, much further than other areas. And of course, if you look at this chart, uh, it is daily water use of wheat, uh, but it really does, does a very good job of picturing the, uh, the progression of wheat plants. And, and uh, generally in Oklahoma, Texas, uh, sometime after September 1st, if we have the moisture, that wheat's going to go on the ground uh, if they want to graze. If they're looking for grain only, uh, it'll probably be mid-October before wheat goes in the ground. And if we look back at 2011, uh, and we're going to look, uh, once we get past this slide, we're going to look at some of those numbers from 2011 through 2012. Uh, but I do want you to, to notice the key points that I have down at the bottom, and that's uh, planting for grazing or grain only. Normal, quote unquote, winter dormancy, wheat doesn't actually ever go dormant, but it, it slows down to a very slow growth rate normally. And, uh, and then it comes out of that, normally it comes out of that uh, dormancy uh, late February, uh, and then and goes reap what we would consider reproductive, or it starts to move up through the stem uh, in that late February, early March standpoint, from a standpoint. And then uh, normally, late April, uh, we're gonna start seeing a boot stage or where the head starts to merge out of the top of the plant. And obviously, you can see by that graph, uh, the further the progression, the higher the daily uh, water use rate, and it is extremely critical from flowering, which is about that peak of where it says heading and ripening. Uh, right about that peak is where the, the flowering, but well, it's denoted on the graph where flowering takes place. And from that point, which is usually late April into to, uh, May, uh, any extreme, whether it be heat or cold, uh, will dramatically affect what the final yield is. So, 
that using that as a background. Next slide. Uh, I really want to focus down on the bottom of this chart. Uh, this is from Alpha's, which is in southwestern Oklahoma, and of course, you, none of you on this call need to be told how uh, dramatic the uh, drought was in 2011. And of course, you can look across that bottom row and, and see those numbers. But then you also understanding again normally planting wheat in, in September if we want grazing into uh, October if we want grain only. Uh, roughly 70 percent of the producers of Oklahoma and, and uh, Texas had crop insurance and to get the best return on that they had to put the grain on the ground. So there were a lot of producers that planted into that dry soil uh, September uh, into October before there was ever any moisture there traditionally known as dusting in and very untraditionally, again, if you look at the numbers and, and know anyway that, that October, late October into November and December is normally a very dry time, starting into a very dry time for, for uh, Texas and Oklahoma. We got that air, uncharacteristic moisture in October, uh, got the plants up and started, uh, got a very good start. Uh, and then you can see what happened. And of course, obviously, then when February is normally fairly dry month for us anyway, we did get some pretty good moisture in March uh, down in that Alpha's area. Uh, and then, uh, relatively speaking, it was fairly dry for April and May. Uh, and then we started getting moisture again in June, but by that time, the, the wheat was already developed in the slide. Now, this is Oklahoma, which uh, translates into Enid or north, north central Oklahoma. Again, the same pattern when you look at 2011 it wasn't quite as severe as it was at Alphys, but uh, definitely a lot more restrictive than the normal rainfall. And of course, you look at October, November, they were, and even into December, they got more moisture than, than what we would normally see during those months. Uh, and the plants would go ahead and develop. Uh, got a good root system under them. Uh, got a lot of stems of filler uh, developed. Uh, and actually, we were able to get grazing from that wheat that actually never germ germinated until uh, late October into November. We got some grazing off that that normally we wouldn't see if it didn't germinate until that late. Uh, next slide. Uh, in April, and then, again, this is Lahoma, so it'd be that heated area. Uh, again, what I want you to notice is left hand side, uh, maximum daily temperatures. Uh, for April, uh, which weren't that extreme, uh, but we did have a few upper 80s and lower 90s. And when wheat is in the state of growth that it's in in April, and again, remembering uh, that chart uh, where we, we start into the, the boot, the heading stage at that point, uh, we really want for maximum production, we want temperatures below 85 degrees, uh, sufficient sunshine. And uh, a soil profile with moisture, at least to get timely moisture for that plant to, to produce maximum grain. Uh, anyway, with the highest temperature you see down at the bottom left was uh, 91, uh, and then there were two days over 90 degrees. Next slide. Uh, April, again, back to Alpha, southwestern Oklahoma, the highest temperature was 105. And if you look at that left hand column, you see uh, the first day of April was 98. Uh, and then you go down to uh, April 20, yeah, April 25th, and it was 105 that day. Uh, next day it was 90, next day it was 95. Uh, then if you go over to the next column over under humidity and look at the minimum humidity, it was down to 8%. Uh, the next day when it was 90, it was 42%. The next day when it was 95, uh, it was 10% humidity. And then if you add to that, if you go over another column, uh, excuse me, two columns, look at wind speed, you start adding uh, temperatures of 90, 95, 105, and low humidity and the kind of wind speeds we saw, obviously the plant can't keep up with that kind of, of uh, transpiration demand on it, and uh, we're going to have some effect. Next slide. So again, we're going back to Lahoma, and we're going to May. And this is a time again when uh, flowering is taking place and that kernel is starting to, to develop, uh, or what we normally call grain fill. And again, if you look at the left hand column and you look at temperature, uh, you start seeing a lot 
or 90s over there. Uh, there are, actually aren't any 100s over there, but uh, down at the bottom I got noted that, you know, the Lahoma average is 3.8 days equal to or above 90 degrees. But if you look at the block directly above the 90, uh, directly above the name or text above 90, uh, you'll see the max, uh, number of days above 90 to equal to and then above 90 degrees is 13. So when they normally average 3.8 days, they average 13 days at 90 degrees or above. And again, also looking at the communities during that time. Next slide. Uh, same was true for Alpha South. This average is uh, 9.8 days equal to or above 90 degrees in May. And they had 18, so they had twice as many days. But if you look at that left hand column, it wasn't just a little bit over 90. It was 100, you see 101 up there, 106, uh, several 100s down towards the bottom. And again, if you look at the relative humidities when that happened, the day it was 106, the minimum humidity was down at 6. Uh, and you look at the wind speed, you know, average 14, almost 15 mile an hour with a 35 mile an hour gust. Uh, I will assure you that does damage to that wheat plant and kernel filling during that time. And what we would normally associate with those kind of days, and especially that number of days, would be shriveled kernels, uh, a lot of shrunken uh, kernels, uh, and severely reducing yields and or it will abort those kernels uh, if they're not far enough along the next slide. Uh, what I want to do is go, I'm going to go through quickly go through a series of slides here and, and just remembering that the numbers aren't as important as a general trend uh, and remembering that uh, on these mesonet slides that uh, from green to blue or blue to green uh, would, would be lower, uh, yellow to red is going to be higher. So uh, these are departure from normals, max, and departures from normal minimum. And I'm just going to refer to them as daytime and nighttime temperatures. Uh, because the way, as in contrast to the way we normally uh, have wheat plants develop uh, under climatic conditions. So, you know, November was pretty average. Next slide. On daytime temperatures, nighttime temperatures were, were pretty normal in November as well. Next slide. Uh, December, again, fairly close to normal, uh, maybe a little lower. Uh, in the western part of the state where most of the wheat's grown in December. Next slide. But the minimum, minimum temperatures in December started to uh, be a little warmer than normal, four to five degrees in a lot of areas, a lot of producing areas. Next slide. Uh, January was uh, daytime temperatures, went to five to six degrees above normal. Uh, in most of the wheat growing areas, in some areas it's seven degrees above normal. Next slide. Uh, January is still above normal, probably not as much, uh, uh, excuse me, this is still January minimum temperatures, again above normal, uh, not as much as daytime temperatures. Next slide. Uh, February, daytime temperatures again, a uh, little below to near normal. Next slide. But the nighttime temperatures, although the daytime temperatures were below, the nighttime temperatures were three to four degrees above normal. Next slide. Then we got into March, and the lower right hand side, uh, again, 9, 10 degrees above normal uh, daytime temperatures. And you can see what the normal daytime temperatures in March are. Uh, so, where normally we'd be in the 60s, uh, low to mid 60s, we were in the low to mid 70s in March daytime. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, and then the minimum temperatures in March as well. Minimum temperatures were running. Uh, 8 to 10 degrees above normal as well. Next slide. Uh, into April, again, it's backed off a little on daytime temperatures as far as relationship to normal. Next slide. Uh, but minimum temperatures or nighttime temperatures were still uh, well above normal, 5 to 6 degrees. Next slide. And uh, uh, again, May uh, temperatures, daytime temperatures. Uh, average maximums. Uh, normally in May, uh, we're going to see uh, upper 70s, lower 80s. Uh, and as you can see in the map in the right hand, bottom right hand, departure from the average to from 5, 6, 7 degrees above normal. 
which puts that map that you see in the upper left side uh, would take those temperatures to above 85 degrees, which I told you is, is critical. We are putting to a critical time in, in that kernel development, but we don't want to see those temperatures above 85 degrees. Next slide. Uh, June, and of course, for most areas, uh, wheat production was completed as far as uh, physiological uh, maturity of that of those kernels, uh, so it was less relevant that that trend continued again. Next slide. Uh, and uh, relative humidities were uh, in March were uh, uh, higher than normal. Next slide. Uh, at April, higher than normal. Next slide. Uh, but in May, uh, it took a dramatic swing back the other way, and relative humidities were well uh, below normal. And again, uh, going back to that graph and, and water use by the wheat plant, it's pretty obvious that those plants came under stress at one of the most critical times of its development. Next slide. Uh, and again, that continued trend continued into June. Next slide. Uh, general rainfall amounts in April, uh, or excuse me, in November. Uh, again, we had good moisture to get those uh, wheat plants up and develop, form a good root system and uh, good pillar development, or or what ended up being total number heads. But again, you can see it was it was still pretty spotty even then. Next slide. Uh, nor, again, normally you don't get a lot of rain. December, uh, even those areas that uh, are light green, uh, that's a significant amount of amount of moisture more than what they would normally get uh, in December as well. Next slide. Uh, start tapering off in January. Next slide. Uh, again, still spotty, uh, but there, they were the has and had nots, which has already been mentioned earlier. Next slide. In March. Uh, the moisture again picked up in the southeastern part of the state, south central part of the state, but really not in the major wheat producing areas, which is the uh, western half of the state. Next slide. Uh, April picked up as well, but again, there were the have and had nots, and, and uh, it was still somewhat spotty. Next slide. But it really dropped in May. And again, we're talking about a critical time in that wheat plant's development when. Uh, it, it can't stand a lot of stress if we want uh, maximum production. Uh, and also knowing that that soil profile was completely depleted, depleted in 2011, so we really needed uh, the timely moisture to make it, uh, the timely moisture to make it a, a complete crop. Next slide. So, uh, whenever uh, these plants develop, under the conditions that they develop under, uh, we would normally expect to see several things. And one of those, obviously, would be uh, uh, lower production than normal uh, based on the conditions we started with and the conditions that, that we finished out the plant with. But, you know, to give you an idea of, the, of how important the timeliness is. Uh, we actually ended up with a crop that was about 140% above the normal crop or the normal five-year average crop. Uh, again, that's a testament <clears throat> to the, the benefit of the moisture early when we got good root system development, good pillar development. Uh, so we ended up with a lot of heads, but then when it started drying, got dry and hot, uh, we couldn't support those heads, and uh, that's when most of the damage was done. So as I mentioned, we planted in the powder dry soil, the crop emerged with abnormal moisture in late October, November plants. I really never shut down due to those warm temperatures and timely rain. So we that area that I showed that was that was a normal dormancy, there wasn't any of that dormancy. And so we had excessive filler and root development. And those were ideal grazing conditions over the over the winter and actually uh, what a problem to have, but actually conditions were too good, and Daryl alluded to this with the early placements last year of cattle going in the feedlot. And the reason they were going in the feedlot early 
was they gained so much weight uh, so early in the winter that uh, they were getting too big for the feedlot, so producers had to go there early. Timely moisture continued it throughout the winter, and the key year being timely moisture, it wasn't uh, excessive by any stretch of the imagination, so we still didn't get any weed guard. Uh, but again, like I said, it wasn't from the drought loss of 2011. Uh, those moisture deficits really began in March. Again, the haves and have nots remain until harvest. Next slide. The hot weather, as we looked at in March, April, May, uh, made the situation worse. And most of the plants have more fillers or actually heads at, at some point that they could support. The kernels started to shrivel and abort in May. Uh, due to dry conditions, and I mentioned we still produced a, a crop that was 100, 140 in Oklahoma, 140 uh, percent over normal. But what was the potential of that crop? You know, we lost a lot of potential. The results were uh, less than desired. Thousands of PKWs or a thousand kernel weights, and literally as it would, it would imply, uh, weighing of a thousand kernels. And uh, millers used that. As an indicator of what kind of meal yield they can get out of the, the kernels or the wheat that they buy. And uh, obviously, they want higher thousand kernel weights. And we, we ended up this year with, with uh, compared to the five year average, especially a lot lower thousand kernel weights. And highly variable proteins in many areas. And, uh, uh, generally, it was high. Texas, Oklahoma average 12.5%, which is, is good protein. Uh, and, we would expect the average around 12%, and it would indicate to the to the baker or the end user that 12.5% protein you could make a really good end product. But if you take 11% uh, protein and 13% protein and average it out as a 12, or you take 9% protein and 14% protein and average it out as a 12, you come up with two totally different products. Uh, and that's actually part of the challenge we faced this year because within a elevator location or delivery point location of uh, wheat, we ended up with uh, protein ranges from 9 to 14 percent coming into the same location. And it was not tied to uh, management decisions. Uh, it wasn't tied to varieties. Uh, and this year was one of those years that we faced that we've never faced before and never tried to look at the quality side of of a situation like we're in, and that is that we have the warm nighttime temperatures, which were actually, in my opinion, more important than the warm daytime temperatures. Uh, Texas to North Dakota ran uh, two to three weeks ahead of normal. As a matter of fact, the mm -hmm. uh, harvest is going on uh, on hard red winter wheat right now in Montana, and they're three weeks ahead of normal. Uh, we never looked at those kind of conditions and then have the kind of moisture stresses that we had in the spring on top of that. And what that did, or what that does to the quality of the end product. Next, so point. So generally, the kernels were small with high variability in kernel characteristics, and uh, the uh, protein was really in a mosaic pattern across southern and central Great Plains. Uh, you know, we're set up to almost identically the same pattern right now. We have not had enough moisture this summer since harvest. To either work ground or do seed bed preparation, or if uh, there are weeds out there and it's a no kill situation, the weeds have never been under enough reduced stress that, that a chemical application would kill them. So, we, the bottom line is we don't have any seed bed preparation. And we don't have any moisture in the soil surface, and it's not just true. In fact, so far, has already been pointed out the drought and the extension of the drought. There is nowhere in the central and southern Great Plains right now. That you could plant wheat into and, and get it to grow at this point. Uh, so we're going to have to have timely moisture, uh, and obviously we don't have any peak moisture still. Uh, but it just makes more critical the need for the timely moisture. So uh, to wish or to expect that we would put wheat in the ground without any moisture and expect that what happened last year to happen again. We'll have that time on moisture in uh, late October into November. Is uh, I don't even think the uh, guys that, that bet on the long shot.
economy, and focus would be low income economy. So it's very critical that we do receive moisture uh, sometime in the next uh, two months for sure, and uh, not just, we either need a lot of moisture or we need some regular time of moisture. I guess we're, we're hoping that that will be So I'm going to quit. I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Mark, and I think that's quite telling when um, when farmers are uh, starting to lose their optimism, uh, the most optimistic group you'll ever find. But um, hopefully we get that El Nino to, to kick in and, and, uh, and bring it back like we did last year and maybe a little cooler in the, the two times of the year there. So we're going to move on to John Fick. Uh, we're going to talk about cotton development, which I was kind of surprised uh, how, how good it looked considering the circumstances. So John? Hey, Mark, thank you very much for allowing me to talk about cotton and the work we're doing here at Texas Tech. Uh, the first slide I have up here shows you an actual fact that dry land systems, it's actually the same field and what happens to dry land um, in, in a uh, dry year, which is the left picture, versus a, um, a wet year, which is the right bottom picture. And we're in a similar kind of situation this year with respect to the, to the, to the left. Um, one of the things a lot of people may not know is that within about a 150 mile radius of uh, Lubbock, Texas, we grow about 60% of the U.S. cotton crop. Uh, we don't produce the high end cotton that comes out of the out of Arizona and, and in California or the southeast, uh, but we grow most of the other use for, for cotton. And if you look at how much of the cotton on the Southern High Plains around Lubbock is irrigated versus dry land, right now we're running about 60 to 65%, which is dry land and about 40 to 35 percent, which is irrigated. And so the numbers I'm going to be talking to you about are related to the total production for the U.S. and there is down on, on to Texas. But the other part of the talk I'm going to focus on is my background is really in soils and microbes in soils and what makes an agricultural system sustainable? How do you deal with drought, high soil temperatures? How can a farmer or producer manage some of the important microbial dynamics that have to go on in this system, and what are some implications relating to drought and this drought that we've been in over the last couple of years? And so, I'm going to start with looking at the U.S. cotton crop um, overall for the U.S. And I'll, again, I'll narrow it down to Texas. And then I have a slide that picks up on some of the things Brian mentioned in his first presentation about some of the impacts that are going to happen as we look at what happens to precipitation and temperature over the next couple of months, uh, looking at some of the distribution areas of cotton growing in the South Central region. So next slide, please. If you look at the statistics that, were, that I was able to get for the week ending uh, July 29th, what you find is that overall the U.S. cotton crop is not doing too bad, but it's starting to come down in terms of the quality of the plant that is being developed and the, and the quality of that fiber that is going to be developed as they start to move into harvesting it. Um, over the next couple months. And so overall, we're seeing a decrease in the rate from good to excellent, down 3%. Poor to very poor is rising. And that increase of poor to very poor is, is the contribution of the South Central region in the U.S. because the amount of cotton we produce relative to the U.S. overall. Next slide. Um, this other statistic out of the USDA compares it with, with the, compares current values with 10-year averages and again, what we're starting to see is a downward trend um, of the quality of the plant into producing a product. Now, one of the interesting things that a lot of people may not know is that having a bigger cotton plant does not necessarily mean you're going to get more cotton. There's a, a project we're working on with USDA here in Con and Lubbock where if you grow the same variety of cotton in Lubbock and you grow the same variety of cotton in Georgia, you get two very different plants. The dry land plant in Lubbock is going to be 8 to 10 inches high. The plant in Georgia may be 3 to 4 feet. But the interesting thing is you end up getting the same number of bowls of cotton on that plant. If you have more moisture and more optimum temperatures, you don't necessarily translate into more cotton. You simply get bigger plants, which you don't use. And so. There's a lot of interest right now looking at this whole question about harvest index, what determines how many bowls 
a cotton plant will produce in this step, and how can you maximize that relative to only producing bigger plants? But what you're starting to see across the U.S. is that uh, we're starting to see a drop in good to excellent, and we're starting to see poor to very poor rise compared to the 10-year average. Next slide, please. For Texas, it even looks more gloomier. Um, we see that it's been increasing in the poor to very poor by six points to 31 percent. Um, the excellence dropped to 34 percent. And if you look around um, the high plains of, of Texas, some of the cotton, because of the lack of moisture in, in, the, in the last month or so, has already cut off. The amount of, of flowers that the plant has produced, the number of squares that it has, and the bowls that are set has actually already started. Even if we get more rain subsequently, for some of these dry land plants, it's not going to matter. The plant has done all that it can uh, for this given year. On an average year, because of hail and wind and, and the spotty nature of rainfall in the region, you, the long-term average is you lose 18 to 20 percent of the crop. Now, last year in 2011, almost 60 percent of the regional crop was lost. Um, high plains cotton growers are looking at going to be exceeding that this year. Even if you if you drive just around the, the Lubbock area within about 20 miles, you'll see some fields that have plants that are six inches high with one bowl on them. Um, you can go southeast of Lubbock down to La Mesa, about 40 miles, and they've received, as part of this monsoonal flow on that outer edge, they've received a normal rainfall, and those plants look very good. One of the major differences this year compared to last year is we have not had the wind that was mentioned from the previous speaker, and we also have not had the continuously high temperatures. Now, we've had temperatures um, that are high, but we have not to the extent that we've had as in, as in 2011. So this year is a little bit different. We still don't have the same, we still have low moisture, but we don't have high soil temperatures. Our evening temperatures are not as high, and the extended period of high temperatures is low. What we're lacking is moisture. Next slide. What this graph shows is the uh, location of the cotton producing areas in the, in, in the region and the higher, the darker the green, the more cotton is, is produced. And if you think back to what Brian talked about earlier, you can see that the larger green areas along the coast, in the coastal cotton, and in the southern high plains, that's where most of the cotton is grown. That's the area that you can receive the, that's in, in more extreme droughts, the greatest departure in terms of rainfall, and the greater increase in uh, temperatures. That's also true of the Arkansas area. So overall, it does not look very good for either uh, the cotton production systems that are currently being watered or even in dry land and what is on tap for next year because, again, as other speakers have said, the farmers going into next year have to have a certain amount of soil moisture to, to get that crop up if they don't irrigate. And I'll show you some other data um, that's going to indicate that we're probably not going to end up any better than last year. Next slide. So what we can see is that when we started out the year, this is the top part of that graphic from the USDA Crop Progress Report. In 2012, we started out pretty much comparable to what we had in our banner year, which was 2010. That, has produced, that, that year produced the most cotton on record. And we started out very good, and, and then if you look at the bottom, what you see is that going into April, the farmers in, in Texas actually planted more cotton this year than they had in previous years. And the crop into June was doing fairly well. You move into planted into squaring means now that the, it, it started to bloom, you have um, now fruit starting to develop. And you can see that going into late June, early July, squaring was ahead of where it's been obviously from last year, and even in the period 2007. 2011. Where we start to have problems now is in the next part of that graphic, and that's setting of the bowl. And while we were ahead a little bit in July, what you start to find is that we are now below what happened in 2011. So what this means is that that crucial period for when the plants now keep the fruits that are pollinated, they are starting to abort those fruits. And so the setting of the bowl 
is actually becoming, is actually dropping lower than what it was previously. Now, it's not quite as low as that 2007-2011 average, but as we move into August, well, what we may end up seeing is that more and more of those plants that have flowers are not setting bowls because of insufficient moisture now and the high temperatures we have just gone through. If that continues, we will be below um, the ability of these plants to maintain those fruits that had them previously set. And we won't know anything about how much is actually harvestable until we get into late August, early September. Now, as I said earlier, the other part of what I do is on soil sustainability and how a farmer can manage what the microbial component of the soils are like in order to help mitigate some of the problems they have with respect to moisture and uh, temperature. Now, I have to say, if, if you get no rain and it's dry, it, it doesn't matter what microbes you have in there. They're not going to be able to do anything beyond a certain point. They are like insurance. They can, they can, they can help a crop deal with certain stresses up to a point, but beyond that, they're not going to have any, any advantage for that given year. The problem that we're going to be starting to face, and I'll show you some data to talk about this, is that as the drought continues, the ability to grow crops, and this is true for corn, this is true for wheat, and this is true for cotton also, these beneficial microbes start to drop out and die in the field. And as a farmer gets into the next season, if these microbes aren't in place, you have to compensate for what they do by adding more energy in the form of fuels and moisture and fertilizer to the field in order to compensate for the loss for the lack of the microbes. Next slide. So one of the major groups in all soils are these fungi called a vascular mycorrhizal fungi. Um, they are they are microscopic fungi you cannot see by the naked eye and unless you bring them into the lab, wash some roots and look at them. And but the slide picture that I that, that I've shown shows you um, this is actually corn roots in which those round dots and all those fine filaments are the mycorrhizal fungi associated with those plants. What you actually have for all agricultural crops, except for things like cabbages and cauliflowers, is most of those plants that we have and we grow, cultivate on any scale, are dependent upon these organisms to help them deal with drought, disease, and particularly the uptake of phosphorus. And in fact, a lot of plants can't take up sufficient phosphorus unless you have these mycorrhizal fungi associated with them. So if, if they're lost from the system, or if the production and the management of the, of the system actually depletes these mycorrhizal fungi, you have to compensate by adding more phosphorus and even more nitrogen to the system to make up for what these organisms would do. Now, as you well know, Nitrogen is fixed by bacteria and contributes to a crop once an alfalfa crop or a soybean crop dies. The problem with phosphorus is you have to actually apply it as a fertilizer uh, or you recycle it in your field. No microorganism takes it out of the atmosphere. It's not in the atmosphere. It's in ocean sediments that are bad or recycled. And so we, and so we have a finite amount of phosphorus and we use a lot of phosphorus for agricultural purposes. The goal of a lot of the stuff that we do, research we do with the USDA, is to, is to design management strategies that help protect the ability of agricultural systems to maintain their level of phosphorus and recycle it more efficiently. Drought and moisture, in combination with our, with our management practices, actually decrease these mycorrhizal fungi. And the question that becomes is, how can you manage them coming out of drought? Next slide. So we set up a series of so we have been setting up a series of studies with USDA to look at various kind of management systems. Cotton, as you know, is a very hard crop on soil because of its lack of root. There's not a lot of root. There's not a lot of carbon goes back into the soil. There's not a lot of priming of the soil microbial community from the plant itself. Those of you who grow cotton and wheat or corn and wheat, you have a good crop. Those plants, because the grass has contributed a lot to the sustainability of that system. If you grow cotton, there's not a lot of roots, not a lot of organic matter goes back in, and you can actually start to then deplete the soil microbial community very significantly. 
But what we were looking at is what happens with various kinds of production systems around the Lubbock region. And this num these numbers simply indicate what happens in a wet year versus a dry year, given the amount of mycorrhizal fungi that may be present in these cropping systems. So what you find is that if continuous cotton that's irrigated tends to be the worst because of the fact that you have this water going on continuously, it's continuous cotton. The best scenario is either dry land, and that has to do with the amount of, of the size of the plant and what it takes up, or if it's irrigated and rotated. Normally they would rotate um, sorghum or soybeans through a cotton field here. If you want to maximize the production, in a sense, you're maximizing your insurance that these organisms are going to be available next year to take up some of the problems, deal with some of the problems of drought and moisture. For most cotton, cotton plants, these mycorrhizal fungi benefit during the first eight weeks of growth. If you can get them up to that point, you have a good opportunity to get your stands established. Now, what happens later is out of their control. That's more the farmer with respect to irrigation or climate impact. But these beneficial organisms have to be in place. If they're not, in some years, a farmer around here, even if you have optimal temperature and optimal moisture, you may not get a crop. We're just running a series of studies right now in, in my lab where we're looking at how much of these, of these fungi are present in most agricultural fields around Lubbock coming out of last year's drought. And a cotton plant in an average year in dry land will have about 40% of its roots colonized by these beneficial fungi. This year, we're seeing in the field, our colonization levels are running about 2 to 5%. And, and then subsequently, what we're looking at in terms of um, stand count size of plants, they're not very hot, they're not very good. And that's part of the thing that's exacerbating the loss of cotton productivity around the Lubbock region. This, this whole interaction between drought, soil temperatures, and these mycorrhizal uh, fungi that are beneficial, but most, or most people don't manage them effectively. Um, you do in a rotation, but you have to be aware of that. So as we move into um, August and September, what we're probably going to see for the U.S. cotton crop because of the Lubbock and the South Plain region is a continuing deterioration of the quality of those, of those fields. And it's unclear then what's going to happen as we, come, as we go into the fall and into next year, particularly with the importance of these fungi to contributing to the establishment of a crop, even if we had an average year. We may end up we may end up just as bad next year um, because these organisms that are necessary are not going to be there and they take time to reestablish. It's like having a forest fire come through. Eventually, in 20 to 30 years, you'll have a you'll have trees back in, but it'll take a while. Thank you, Mark. All right, thank you, John. Um, we're going to move to a couple of updates from uh, from the state climatologists. I uh, just a note in the chat box, um, Mary Knapp from Kansas had to leave early, but she did uh, make some comments here that uh, they're, they've been having some troubles up there with the rain, uh, about 52% of average in the last week. They've had the high temperatures like, um, and there's some serious problems there with soybeans uh, continuing to forest blossoms and, and uh, so uh, maybe some domestic livestock. Um, we'll go on. We'll start uh, here with uh, Barry uh, to talk about some of those uh, fringe areas of Louisiana that have been uh, dealing with some drought. Barry, we're only fringe because of the drought here, but, uh, <laughs> but thanks, Mark. Uh, give, give me the next slide. I only have one slide here to show you guys, and uh, Louisiana is on the edge of this larger core area of drought found across the midsection of the United States, you know, shown by Brian Fuchs earlier. I'm sure you guys know all about it. Uh, so we have a little bit of uh, D1 across the uh, northern parishes, basically the northern third of the state being impacted by the dry conditions. And overall, south of Louisiana is actually doing fantastic. In fact, uh, if you look at the 30-day rainfall, that's the radar estimated 30-day rainfall on the bottom uh, right there. Uh, it's showing you know, most of, a lot of those coastal parishes, all those areas that are in pink are between 10 and 15 inches mm -hmm. of rainfall. And, uh, you know, the areas in red, for the most part, we're looking at, uh, you know, six to eight or even more rain. So the uh, southern half of the state has been excessively wet with, the, with that afternoon convection and um, no issues down there whatsoever. Now, um, 
10 to 15 inches may sound like a whole lot of rainfall in South Louisiana, but you also have to realize that 6 to 7 inches is considered normal. So we're running, you know, well above normal, but it's not tremendously above normal like you might see in some other states where, you know, 10 inches would be a, a really big deal. Uh, but clearly we have a very strong uh, you know, south to north gradient with high amounts to the south, and it, it tapers off pretty dramatically as we get up into the, those northern parishes. So we do have our issues, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, the vast majority of the states seem to be doing okay. I'll go ahead and leave it there. Thanks, Barry. Um, it's um, excellent. Barry um, answered like almost you know, tell us what's going on. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. As we get a little bit closer to Oklahoma on the drought monitor, we see now that 97% of Oklahoma is covered by extreme to exceptional drought. That's actually the highest amount ever for the state of Oklahoma with the drought monitor effort. Um, now, of course, we had higher amounts of exceptional drought last year uh, with the drought in the Southern Plains last year. But as far as extreme to exceptional, this is the highest amount ever. Um, so it's ind indicative that some parts of the state most notably the eastern third and the northeastern parts of the state, are probably a little bit worse off this year than they were last year at this time. Whereas western Oklahoma, they've been in near continuous drought for going on close to two years now. So, uh, but again, this is a flash drought situation. So if we take a look at the next slide, um, we can see what's been going on over the last uh, several months. Um, you look at uh, northern uh, Norman, Oklahoma, which is the epicenter of the worst conditions right now, it seems like, has gone 63 days with less, of, less than a quarter inch of rainfall in any single calendar day. Um, and of course, those uh, numbers are spread throughout uh, much of central and, and parts of western and northeastern Oklahoma, as well as the Panhandle. Um, next slide. Uh, you can see what's going on with uh, western Oklahoma. This is a, a farm pond up in uh, Harper County where I actually go fish at. It's on my best friend's parents' place. This is when the uh, conditions were actually uh, good. This was probably the last time conditions were good in western Oklahoma, May 9th of 2009. I snapped a picture of that pond. That pond is spring-fed, so it pretty much goes and with, along with the water table. When the water table's good, um, that pond looks good. It's never been dry in the 35 years I've been going out there. So next slide. This is what it looks like, and this is what it's looked like over the last two years. So this is a good picture of what's been going on in western Oklahoma. Um, farm ponds uh, either diminishing or, or all the way gone. Um, we have fire danger throughout the state. Uh, and of course, all the impacts associated with this uh, extreme to exceptional are present. And those have been uh, intensifying as we've gotten into April and May, and especially as we've entered the summer months, um, which is exactly what you would expect with the flash drought situation. Thank you, Gary. Um, before wrapping up, I, I don't see any other questions, but I did have a, a couple of things that came up here. Uh, John, I'd like to ask, uh, you, you mentioned that it may take a, a long time to reestablish fields and, like you say, after a forest fire, it could take 20, 30 years. Um, what kind of time horizon, if you've got good uh, moisture and, and good conditions, do uh, you think it take? How many years or so? Do you think it takes to reestablish uh, the, the fungi? Uh, based on some of the uh, preliminary work that we've done over the last couple of years, it may take another decade. Uh, and part of it has to do with the, with the um, uh, kind of crop they're going to plant. If, if farmers in the region only plant cotton, it may, take, it may take 50 years. Part of the difficulty with the two is these fungi uh, come in um, from other places. And so, the question then becomes is what are, what are the sources of anoxin? In If you were in Florida or if you were, if, if, well, particularly if you were on the Gulf Coast and you were doing more truck farms, you could add, you can actually go buy an optimum of these fungi from producers and they put it, and they put it in their bed um, if you're growing small row crops. If you're, if, but if you're doing the acreage that they would do for corn or for cotton or for wheat, you simply can't afford the inoculum to inoculate, to re inoculate your field. And like most organisms, you're initially going to get those or fungi that are ne not necessarily beneficial. In the same way, there are weedy plants, there are weedy fungi. And it's the, it's the more beneficial ones take time to reestablish. And so, one of the things that we're also looking at here in, in West Texas is one of the important inoculum sources 
of these fungi are the CRP lands that are around the region. And so by those CRP lands actually become hot spots or focal spots for those beneficial organisms that then will move by natural processes into your field, but they're going to take time to do that. Thanks, John. Um, and uh, and Daryl, uh, you uh, talked about the restocking or, or putting um, cattle on the field, the field last year. I was wondering um, if we did get good rains of uh, El Nino, hopefully uh, coming in, um, are the pastures going to be in good enough shape to take on the additional cattle that, that we could get this fall? Well, I think it depends on which type of pastures we're talking about. Uh, improved pastures generally can recover much faster than the native pastures. Um, you know, again, if we have fall moisture, uh, we can do wheat pasture in the western part of the state, western and central parts of the state, uh, and, and we would have uh, fescue and uh, would be the primary cool season forage <clears throat> available in the eastern part of the state, and, and it probably would come back reasonably well, although it depends in part on how it's been managed through the drought up to that point. Um, so you could see that, uh, that there. In a longer term sense, um, the, the recovery of pastures, you know, we really don't have a very good sense yet of how long it's going to be to recover. We know last year's drought caused significant loss of, of stands, mm -hmm. particularly in the western part of the state in some of the native pastures and in, and in some of the pastures like the old world blue stems. Um, but because we've had such a limited summer this year, it's really difficult to evaluate that. But in those cases, again, we're talking about multiple years for those to recover with good management and obviously producers are going to be under a lot of stress to restock those pastures probably sooner than they really need to be. So it's going to be a long-term effort on those pastures as well. And um, Mark, uh, for from uh, conversations maybe you've been having, uh, you know, the, the planting in September is usually, you know, trying to get the, uh, the cattle versus, versus waiting. And um, do you have a sense of which direction uh, farmers may be going this year, whether they're, they're maybe going to hold off and, and hope for uh, better rain by October so they can get a crop, or whether they're going to try to test in and hope that they can get the emergence of cattle. Uh, my bet is they're going to dust in, but it won't be related to forage production. It'll be related to insurance programs because, just like last year, uh, the benefits of planting versus prevented planting on an insurance program. Uh, they're better off if they put the seed in the soil and it doesn't come up than if they mm -hmm. try to wait for rain and, and then if they don't get one, they have to claim uh, prevented planting. So uh, it's more insurance driven than anything else at this point. But, but wheat, unlike uh, livestock, uh, you know, if we start getting moisture again, in a timely manner, I think we could, we saw what could happen last year. You know, 140 percent of a normal crop with very limited moisture, but the livestock guys have got a lot. You know, as Daryl outlined, they've got a lot further to go to, to recover. But if we start getting right, we're back in business. Well, there, there, there's that optimism that we expect to find with uh, with the guys. Um, okay, well, I'd like to. To thank uh, Brian, Daryl, Mark, and, and John for the presentations, and for uh, Barry, uh, Barry, and Mary for the <laughs> updates uh, on our region as well. Uh, our, um, I'd just like to mention our next uh, webinar will be September 13th, um, and we'll also do a short briefing on August 23rd, the, the fourth Thursday of the monthly voluntary short, uh, just kind of status and outlook part of the briefing, and then we'll do a closing comment. Uh, watch our YouTube site for periodic updates as the drought continues to evolve rapidly. We've been posting some uh, direct YouTube uh, videos, I guess, about five minute briefings um, on a more frequent basis because things are changing so quickly. As always, we encourage you to continue to spread the word to make sure that all those dealing with aspects of the drought are part of this larger community that they can access the support they need. Uh, thank you for your time today, and we look forward to continuing this conversation with you in the future. Have a great week, and hopefully we'll see some rain and some cooler temperatures around here. Thank you.